good afternoon to everyone. So my name is Sofia Ramos. I'm professor of finance at the SEC Business School. And today, joined with my two distinct guests, I have the, we have the honor to start this uh, France-Singapore Sustainable Finance Conference. So let me present my, uh, my guest uh, speakers. So we have two governors from central banks. So uh, Governor Javi Menon, so Managing Director of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and the Governor of, uh, of Banque de France, Monsieur François Villoura de Gaillot. So I'm very pleased to, to have you here. Thank you very much for, for being here. And I will start now to uh, present uh, our topic uh, that we are going to discuss. So we will start by the presenting the network for greening the financial system, uh, which was a, a very important uh, step and a, a very important organization that uh, started in December 2017. So Banque de France was uh, one of the foundings of this uh, network. Can uh, Governor Villera explain a little bit how was born this organization? What were the first measures? Uh, what are the main concerns of this organization? Uh, thank you, Sofia. And indeed, it's a nice story. It's one of my preferred stories. Uh, NGFS was born in Paris in 2017. And it was a very specific context, if you remember. Donald Trump had been elected president in the US and he unfortunately announced spring 17 that the US would leave the Paris Agreement. And then President Macron decided to organize a one planet summit in Paris, December 17. And we on our side, by the way, Monetary Authority of Singapore, dear Ravi, Banque de France, and six other founding members, we were eight at the start, uh, decided to join this effort and to create this network for greening the financial system, network of central bankers and supervisors. It was a coalition of the willing at the start, but it grew quickly and efficiently. Uh, we had a first conference in Amsterdam, the following year, and the Dutch National Bank was also one of the founding members. We had a first strong message that climate-related risks belong to financial risk. And this is probably, I would say, the cornerstone. I don't mm. know, Ravi, if uh, you will agree. Uh, but it's not only a nice to have, it's not only a question of personal conviction, it's a professional duty for us as supervisors and central bank to assess, to steer, to reduce climate-related risk. Then we publish different reports. Uh, I won't elaborate. We publish scenarios, which is very important. We increase significantly in number. We are now about 110 members. And it became more and more this coalition of the committed, which we are indeed. By the way, the US Fed joined at the end of 2020, which was also good news. And I will stop there saying that the last but very significant step is to have now a global chair, because my friend Ravi Menon was elected as chair of the NGFS some months ago. And it's also a very good sign. So I'll, I'll take uh, on this. So uh, you are being elected since the beginning of the year for sharing the network, for greening the financial system. What are now the priorities in your agenda? Yes, so, well, thanks, thanks, Sophia, for, for having us and doing this. Um, it's a real pleasure to be, to be associated and to be given this, this opportunity with the NGFS, which uh, thanks to the vision that uh, Francois displayed in 2017 at a critical moment in our history, uh, I think we're off to a very good start. Uh, the last four years has seen tremendous progress on the part of the M NGFS. Um, so I'm inheriting a very good network, a very committed network. Uh, I don't need to tell central bankers or regulators anymore how important this is. Uh, the question now is, we know it's important, what do we do about it? Um, we will press on with the work on uh, supervision, and I think that is the primary tool that we have to nudge the financial sector uh, to do two things. One is to build up their climate resilience so that they can manage climate-related risks as they emerge, 
both transition risks and physical risks. And I think that consciousness is growing. The supervisory practices and tools are developing, and we need to push the boundaries further. One of the areas there that we want to look at is the transition pathways that financial institutions have announced. So many of them have announced net zero targets. Uh, what is the role of supervision? How do supervisors engage in this, this uh, dialogue, in this discussion? I think it takes us to new territory. Our traditional tools may be less relevant, and we've got to get creative about how we want to do this. Uh, second is, you know, I think it was, again, I must go back to Francois' vision. I'm sure they must have discussed many different formulations of the, type, the name of the organization or the network. And they chose network for greening the financial system. And that's one of the things that attracted me a lot and why the MAS joined as a founder member and why when Francois and I discussed and you know, I thought it was uh, uh, you know, my duty as it were to contribute to this effort. It's not just about making them more climate risk conscious. It's about how the financial system can become greener and help to push the transition towards a greener economy, a more sustainable future. So it goes beyond the risk dimensions. And that's something we are thinking very hard about in the NGFS now. How can we go beyond that? So new streams of work on monetary policy, for instance. Um, what does climate risk mean for monetary policy? What do these scenarios, climate scenarios, mean for the conduct of monetary policy and monetary policy operations? Um, we're also now looking at nature-related risks. Um, the climate risks and biodiversity loss risks are quite interrelated. Um, in the MAS, when we issued environmental risk management guidelines in Singapore, uh, we called it environmental risk and included not just climate change risk, but also loss of biodiversity, pollution. Basically, our natural ecosystems are at risk from human activities. And we have no way of measuring nature capital the way we measure physical capital. And we need to build up their consciousness. And there are financial risks emanating from this loss of this ecosystem. So that's another area we're going to focus on, on and to build continually on capacity building. I think this is the raison debt of the, of the NGFS to build up capacities across central banks and, and uh, supervisors across the world to learn how to deal with these new risks. And I think that is a very powerful calling now that, as, you know, as Francois told us, we've grown from eight members to more than 110 members in a very short span of time. Any organization that grows that rapidly, you have to make major adjustments to to be more inclusive, to make sure you are relevant to the requirements and needs and interests of all your members. So that will be another key priority for me in the NGFS. Thank you very much. So if I you guess, allow me, uh, uh, yeah. Sophia, just one sentence to pay tribute to 13 people who built the global secretariat of the NGFS. Uh, yes. They have an excellent chair, mm -hmm. uh, but the global secretariat remains based in Paris, in the Banque de France. We do welcome, by the way, that some members from other central banks, including, I guess, MAS, MAS yes. in the future, will enhance this agreement. But it's one of our prides. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question that I think the audience uh, for sure has. So what are the main differences and similarities that you see between Asia and Europe in terms of practice? Well, I think the goal is the same the ambition must be the same because this is a global problem. It, the, it, it's not an Asian problem or a European problem. The world as a whole must peak emissions 2025, reduce 40% by 2030 and achieve net zero by 2050. I mean, our common goal is to keep temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. It's going to be extremely difficult and challenging and everyone needs to do their part. I think the difference is the transition pathway. The end goal is the same, but the pathway to reach that will be different in Europe and in, and in Asia. And in Asia, when I speak to people, uh, the key issue is how do you manage or how do you minimize the trade-off between decarbonization and development? Um, Million, there are hundreds or thousands of villages 
which do not have electricity. If you look across Indonesia, India, even parts of China and Southeast Asia, and the situation is the same in Latin America. Uh, to bring electricity to villages, education and social development, um, they need to find new ways of doing it. Burning coal is not the way. Uh, but are they all ready for renewables? It's not clear. It's not economically viable in many instances. It's very geographic specific. So we've got to find a way to use finance to prompt and motivate transition financing from brown assets progressively becoming green assets, brown sources of energy progressively becoming greener. We can't do it in one go. Um, so I think the key challenge in Asia is transition financing. Uh, and that is a bigger order than, say, in Europe, which is a lot more advanced uh, in terms of social economic development and has the resources for moving to renewables, although the Ukraine situation now has really complicated matters. And in some ways, you're seeing similar transition challenges even in Europe. So I think in that sense, we are converging. But uh, I would say same goal, same ambition, but different pathways. And finance needs to recognize these different pathways to achieving that. Thank you. Governor? No, I, I would agree with Ravi's sum up that we have the same target. But each of us has its story, its mandate, and its speed, probably. Uh, on this topic, we in Europe like to think that we lie a bit ahead. I don't know if it's right, <laughs> but uh, as you know, it's a strong political awareness, very acute one even in some of our countries, and especially for young citizens. And so Europe has a program, Fit for 55, to reduce its emission. In the financial field, Europe has a very ambitious agenda about disclosure, labeling, be it for non-financial corporates or for financial institutions. On monetary policy, the ECB lies a bit ahead in greening. Having said that, we are all in the same boat, and this is one of the very important message of uh, Ravi Menon being chair. I really admire what the Monetary Authority of Singapore, for example, is doing. And it's not uh, the privilege of Europe or of the northern countries. Uh, it's really our collective achievement. And to, to go even a bit further, this one, as you presented, as the Asian challenge, Ravi, decarbonation slash development and what kind of balance. Uh, for sure, development means a different thing in advanced economies like the European ones. But is there a trade-off between green objectives and competitiveness? And this is a debate we start having in Europe. Is there a trade-off between decarbonation and social justice? Because it must be a fair transition. So we all Again, we have different paths or different speeds, I agree, but if you look, the challenges are quite the same. And one of the purpose of NGFS is obviously to share best practices. Thank you. I, I have a question. So uh, we, we've been talking about also about uh, biodiversity risks. Uh, the Bank of France, mm -hmm. I think, was one of the pioneering mm -hmm. um, uh, to launch a, a study that quantify and measures these risks. So uh, is this also going, this experience mm. going also be incorporated on the network for greening the financial mm. system? What are the goals? Indeed, we published a working paper last year yes. called the Silent Spring. Spring for the Financial System, which raised significant interest, including in the NGFS. And again, thanks to, to, to Ravi and the steering committee. We now decided to create a dedicated working group mm. in the NGFS about biodiversity. It will be co-shared by Sylvie Goulard, deputy governor here, and uh, somebody from the Dutch That's National right. Bank, yeah. but it will be very inclusive in, in its format. Uh, it's the next frontier, mm. I, I would tend to say. Uh, I, I don't know if you would agree, but we are probably on biodiversity where we were on climate some years exactly, ago. Yeah. We know it's a key challenge. We try to measure the economic damages and how economic policy and financial system can contribute to reduce these economic damages. 
we must be in the future about biodiversity, and you spoke earlier about natural capital. I would say as precise, as professional, as we are now on climate, and we made decisive progress in the last five to, to six years. So it's probably the start of the journey, but I am convinced that this journey will be as important and hopefully as promising as a climate one. Uh, last remark, uh, you are aware, everybody knows about TCFD and, what, what, and COP26 and now 27. You are aware that there is a parallel slack for nature-related uh, risks, TNFD, N being nature, and COP15, which is happening in China at present, a bit complicated by COVID, obviously. But again, it's uh, the start of a path, but an absolutely promising one. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, just so you, what no. resources are going to be mm. allocated to these new... Uh, yes, we, we have to find those resources. And uh, I'll be quite honest, um, when we discussed this at the NGFS, even before I became the chair, uh, you would get people who are asking, look, we've got our hands full with climate risk. This is unknown, even more difficult to measure. Do we need to deal with this now? And uh, I think, thankfully, the consensus built around the view that we do need to act on this now. And, I, I'm very, and I've been pushing this line too, and Francois alluded it to it. We ignored climate risk for too long, and that's why we are having to play catch up. We didn't know how to measure it, and so now we're trying to play catch up. I hope we will not be in a similar situation with respect to nature related risks in five or 10 years' time. When those ecosystems have degraded and our agricultural activities are affected, our food supplies are affected, water supply, uh, is in danger in many parts of the world because of the degradation of the natural environment. When these problems start to emerge, they will have huge economic and financial costs. And then we're all confronted with this upfront. And by then, it's actually quite late. So I do think we need to start working on it now so that we prepare for it in the future and not repeat the mistake with respect to climate risk, which where we have to play catch up. And I should also say nature-related and biodiversity loss risks have quite a degree of overlap with climate-related risk. And I'm coming from Southeast Asia. One of the primary challenges is deforestation. You have it in many parts of Southeast Asia and also in the Amazon forest. Um, it is a compounding of two effects, the loss of biodiversity and the destruction of natural ecosystems and river systems and so on, coupled with, of course, you're losing natural carbon sinks and you know emitting huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. It's a combination of both ecosystem risks and climate risks coming together. And I think it's widely important that we address this as a matter of priority. So we have uh, set up a task force on this, uh, led by the Banque de France and the Dutch Central Bank, and wide-ranging interests from members. And I've been telling them, include more countries from tropical parts of the world, because they have the most biodiversity. Um, even in a small city-state like Singapore, a small natural forest, the biodiversity there is massive, both flora and fauna. So involve them in this discussion, sensitize them to the issue so that we can address this early enough. Because the world as a whole benefits when you protect their biodiversity, especially in the tropics. Happy to hear that. That is a priority. I, I will switch now to another topic, which is, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, a discussion on central banks about uh, orderly uh, scenarios of a transition and disorderly. Uh, we have now a complicated situation on the commodities markets, also on the energy market. Uh, how do you see that will affect these uh, transition and the scenarios of transition? Yes, it, it will be challenging. But, you know, as we often say, with every challenge comes an opportunity. Basically, we've all been saying, you know, how can any of this happen without a carbon price? Well, thanks to the war in Ukraine, horrifying as it is, you know, the tragic as it is, Russia has given us a carbon price. We all have a higher carbon price now. Uh, and with uh, fossil fuel price uh, supplies at risk, uh, we have to think how we're going to... The, the transition is no longer orderly and smooth. It has been brought forward. It's disorderly, but we have to get over this hump. 
And I think if we do the right things now, we can accelerate the agenda. I know that short term, there will be huge dislocations and economic uh, uh, impact, competitiveness and so on. So even if we have to make pragmatic short term choices, we must find that it doesn't lock us in over the medium term, that we must quickly get back to a path uh, of, of, uh, of cleaner energy. And I think for the first time now, you realize the importance that the environmental sustainability and energy security have come together. That dependence on imported fossil fuels is a source of vulnerability, geopolitical vulnerability. And that if you can have renewables in your own country, of course, there are parts that still come from other countries, but you know, it, I think it's a great way to reconcile between the heightened needs of energy security and environmental sustainability. So there will be challenges. I'm not minimizing them. In fact, I'm quite worried about some of the disorderliness. But I think if you do the right things, this can be a great pathway towards sustainability. Thank you. So the fact that now Europe is moving from uh, energy from Russia, how, how do you see that also will affect these uh, scenarios? of? Uh, I, I would tend to agree with Ravi's sum up, uh, to, to, to put it in a nutshell, in short term, contradiction. In the long term, compatibility of the Ukrainian shock and climate transition. In the short term, we, what you call pragmatic choices, uh, I like your <laughs> expression. <laughs> it means that unfortunately, some countries will probably have to replace Russian gas by coal, which is bad, or oil. But in the long run, I strongly believe that climate transition and diversification of resources go together. And you mentioned, I found it interesting, the high price due to the Russian aggression as a, a carbon price. Uh, we shouldn't forget that when one day, possibly, oil and gas prices will decrease. I hope that one day the war will be over and we could see some flattening or diminution of energy prices. Then yeah. it will be very important to have a structural carbon price and not only a short-termist one. Mm. Having said that, and coming to the first part of your question about orderly or disorderly transition, it's not yet one, to, mm -hmm. to say the least. And it's why we work uh, in the NGFS with various scenarios. I think it's very important, let us be honest, about climate risk themselves, we don't know precisely. If you look at IPCC, they publish various physical scenarios, which are not reassuring, but which have diverse outcomes. Our job in NGFS is to translate these physical various scenarios in macro-financial scenarios. We made significant progress. Ravi, I guess we will update this scenario by next summer and still next year to bring them more and more consistent with IPCC scenarios in order to provide to all players, be they governments or private companies or financial institutions, at least the same language, the same grammar. They will have various scenarios. Each of them will see what kind of effects it could have in, its can in his country or in his economic sector. But at least we could have a diversity of scenarios, but a commonality of language. And, and this would help to prepare an orderly transition. Uh, Managing Director Menon, I have also a question that I think uh, our audience uh, might have because I mean, we all agree that has been a great progress. We have seen a, uh, a great progress this year, as you say, to catch up uh, all these uh, last years. But still, I mean, the latest report, they say that uh, uh, we need to accelerate. So mm. what, what, what can uh, uh, the, the network help to accelerate this path towards uh, that zero transition? Yeah. So um, as I said, uh, one of the things that the NGFS will look at in its work on supervision is on looking at uh, the transition pathways of banks. Um, now, the NGFS has kind of blazed a trail on some of these issues. 
and has now passed on that work to the professional competent standard setting bodies like the Basel Committee, the FSB, IOS, and so on. Um, and now we're looking at the next frontier, which goes beyond the environmental risk management to transition pathways. So many of them have announced net zero targets. How are you going to get there? Are they consistent with the IPCC scenarios, the International Energy Agency scenarios for the energy sector? There are transition pathways for maritime, for aviation. Uh, your loan book has got exposures to these sectors. How are you doing your transition in line with those? So we're looking at those kinds of, now it's not about setting rules or requirements, that's for the Basel Committee to decide, but to raise awareness and have supervisory discussions with the banks on these issues, I think it's important. Uh, the scenario work Francois has, has, has highlighted, and I think it's spot on, I, so I don't need to elaborate. We're also looking at how we can harness the power of the, financials, of the private financial sector and the official sector, private-public partnerships, for effective financing towards transition. And that, I think, is you know, at maybe at the edge of our mandates as supervisors or central banks. But we have considerable convening power. Um, we have considerable uh, analytical firepower and uh, the networks among the key players. And if we can bring these key players together, um, the MDBs, the official sector, the institutional investors, the banks, they all play different roles. And if we can harness their energies together, uh, philanthropic organizations, uh, and come up with financing structures that will make transition easier. Today, there is great interest, but if you look at the actual amount of money going into this, it's still not what it needs to be. So I think it needs to be given a push. Central banks and regulators can't do this on our own, but I do think the NGFS through the networks that it has, can help to bring some of these parties together. So that's another thing that I'm hoping we can do uh, to go back to our original aim, which is to green the financial system. Not just manage the risks, but actually to green the financial system. So I'll, I'll take on this about the solutions of blended finance. I mean, they are very interesting, but can they pose also some risks to the system? H how do you see them? We have to look at risk, mm -hmm. but we must be open and confident. And I think that technological and, yes, financial innovation will help us to win the climate transition battle. Mm -hmm. we, we know there is some kind of greenwashing, for instance, beside all these green bonds, etc. But to, to give an obvious example, could we go towards a standardization of green labels? and of green disclosure. We are not very far away. Uh, as I said, we are making significant progress in Europe. There is also this common work under the ISSB yes. sponsorship. So I am confident. And, and if there are specific financial risks, it's our job. Uh, can I add to uh, Ravi's already impressive program and very rich program, which I completely share? <laughs> Still one item, if the chair agrees, uh, which is the power of stress tests, climate-related stress tests for financial institutions. I think this is really a game changer. This is a very promising tool. We are only at the start. We were in ACPR, the French supervisors, among the first ones to have such climate stress tests last year. Frankly, we learned many things and we still have to learn. But we encourage all supervisors to test and learn, and possibly to use NGFS scenarios, and possibly not only to look at 2050, yes. we know that climate is a long-term risk, but also to 2030. And yeah. why do I say that? Because transition is accelerating. Uh, which are mixed news. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, in the short term, some difficulties like Ukraine, but Possibly, probably, transition will go quicker than expected, which means that transition risks are more important than physical, physical risks in this stress test. So we have a very powerful tool. The ECB is running its first stress test, also uh, as a test. We shouldn't draw premature conclusion on capital requirements, but I will have a dream, Ravi. If we say in the till 25, 
we together completely uh, fine-tune this new methodological tool, then it could become systemic. We could draw common conclusions. Yeah. And believe me, it's a game changer. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. I'm glad uh, Francois mentioned that, uh, slipped my mind about the importance of climate scenarios leading to stress tests and leading to risk mitigation actions. Mm. Mm. We need to see through that whole value mm -hmm. chain. And one of the issues that we want the NGFS to push harder is how can we make the stress tests lead to action? Uh, because you don't want to draw false consolation that this is a long-term risk. Uh, it is different from the usual stress tests that we central banks do. Um, risk of a recession in a major economy, for instance. Uh, that's happening in 18 months' time. You've got to start preparing now. And I want to make sure that our stress tests lead to prompt actions too. Calculated, deliberate, but uh, not to delay action. And this is a challenge because we need to bring forward, and I think transition risks, more than physical risks, concentrate the mind a lot. Because if you have a tripling of carbon prices, effective carbon prices in the world, uh, is your portfolio resilient? I think that's a more impactful question than say, uh, if sea levels rise uh, you know, 50 centimeters in 20 years time, uh, most banks will say, oh, okay, I, I can still, my duration of my loans is over by then, uh, I don't have to worry about it. So I think we need to use a stress test in a more impactful fashion. And that's something the NGFS is going to be focused on. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for participating Please. on this conference. It's a great pleasure and to also to see all these positive insights about what the network for uh, greening the financial system is doing. And uh, I leave the rest to the, to the to conference to proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.